Hello and welcome to the Department of Energy's SBIR STTR Funding Opportunities webinar. My name is Zina Al Yusuf. I am with the DOE SBIR Programs Office and I will moderate today's webinar. Uh, today's presenters are um, SBIR Outreach uh, Manager Eileen Chant. Eileen will provide you with an overview of the federal SBIR STTR programs, DOE SBIR STTR technology areas, DOE application and award process as it relates to the FY25 phase one release one funding opportunity announcement or FOA as we refer to it. Also, we have um, um, uh, our Office of Inspector General uh, uh, will uh, present and cover the SBIR uh, fraud, waste, and abuse uh, issues. New for 2025, uh, we are holding two webinars for the um, funding opportunity announcement. The first one is today, uh, today's webinar, which is dedicated to the overview of the DOE SBIR applica <clears throat> application and award process. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, Friday, August 9, uh, at 2 p.m., um, we are hosting a one-hour Q&A session or question and answer session. So today you will listen to the presentation and you'll join us tomorrow with your questions. We are doing this as we realize that a lot of questions are answered through the presentation and uh, we want to make sure we are that we are getting your unique questions. Uh, the recording of both webinars um, along with the uh, presentation will be posted uh, on our website under the Funding Opportunities webpage. So again, welcome, and now let's start, Eileen. Thank you, Zina, and hello, everyone. Um, my name, as Zina indicated, is Eileen Chant. I am the Outreach Program Manager for the DOE SBRS TTR Programs Office. My email and my phone number are shown on these slides. You will be receiving, able to download these slides from our um, website um, in a few days. Um, so feel free to reach out to me with questions, but I also encourage you to join our Q&A session tomorrow um, and ask us your questions. Uh, for those new to SBIR, STTR programs, it is a uh, in excess of $4 billion a year research and development fund that goes exclusively to small businesses who are developing technology with the intent to commercialize. Um, SBIR and STTR fund ideas that are too high risk for the private sector. Um, these are early stage ideas and these grants allow you to develop your innovation um, into um, a later stage closer to commercialization stage um, with non-dilutive funding. Um, it is um, a tax on extramural R&D to the federal government. So in any agency that has um, um, in excess of $100 million a year in um, research and development must spend 3.2% of it on SBIR. And the larger agencies must spend 0.45% of their extramural R&D on STTR. What are the goals of these programs, which are also called America's Seed Fund? Um, they are to stimulate technological innovation utilizing small businesses. Um, one of the other statutory directives of the program is to foster and encourage participation in this program by socially, by women or socially or economically disadvantaged persons. And the federal government is also interested in seeing that innovations derived from federal funding make it to um, the private sector um, in order to provide, um, to grow businesses, um, 
create jobs and also to benefit um, the communities um, within our country. The STTR program is a little bit different. Um, it does require cooperative research and development between a small business and a research institution. These are the 11 agencies that have SBIR programs. You can see these are the fiscal year 22 budgets, and you can see that DOE is the third largest agency. But there are um, all of these agencies offering these non-dilutive grants and contracts. And um, there's a lot of overlap in what the agencies fund. So you really should get to know all of the agencies and pick a couple that are um, interested in your technology. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket and um, really probably want to identify a couple of agencies which um, hold the potential to fund your um, technology development work. One thing about the agencies is they are not all the same. Um, some issue grants and some issue contracts. Um, the difference between those two is important. The contracting agencies are potentially going to be your customer at the end of the day. For example, the Department of Defense, they may, if they're interested in your technology, they may be your customer after your technology is developed. The Department of Energy is a granting agency and we are unlikely to be your customer at the end of the day. So when you are developing your technology, um, it will obviously be something that is within DOE's mission scope, but you do have to have a private sector or a commercialization plan and to understand where your market um, would, where your customers are going to come from um, once the SBIR funding has uh, run its course. You can go to sbr.gov, the awards page, to understand what agencies are there, what, what the different agencies are funding and where you might be a fit. The DOE's mission is threefold. Um, people don't always know that in addition to um, development of clean um, and renewable energy technologies, that our mission also includes advancing um, engineering and energy sciences. And finally, the DOE is also um, tasked with nuclear security. So a few more specifics about our organization that I hadn't already mentioned. We issue grants, as I said before, you present us with your idea in response to our focus topics. And um, it is your idea to, if we award you a grant, um, we like your idea. It looks like a well-planned out prop novel idea. And, uh, but it is your technology to develop and to take to the marketplace at the end of the day. Again, we have focus topics. They are more wide ranging than most people would expect. So don't Think that you know what we fund until you have delved into our topics document. We have two solicitations per year. The topics come out in July. That's the release one that we're talking about today. But topics also come out in November. Three months after the topics come out, your applications are due. Another unique thing about our program is that a letter of intent is required, um, and that is going to be um, later this month. You have to provide us with a short write-up on what it is that you're going to propose. That is a required part of the application process. And finally, for those of you who have never submitted an application to DOE, SPIR, STTR programs before, please take note that we have an application assistance program. It's, we call it phase zero. It is free to you and it is available to first timers. It is open now for this release. You receive a coach and they will help you put together your first application. It's important to understand the differences between SBIR and STTR. Um, we do have 
a level of effort workbook, you can click on this link or use this QR code to download that to understand if you are in compliance with um, which program you're in compliance with. SBIR does allow you to have a part a nonprofit research institution partner, but STTR requires it. The principal investigator must be majority employed by the small business for SBIR. And um, for STTR, the PI can be an employee of either the small business or the nonprofit research institution. Here on the right, um, it shows the level of effort requirements. The minimum uh, is that for SBIR, the small business must do two thirds of the R&D, while for um, STTR, the small business does do a minimum of 40% of the R&D, while the research institution must do a minimum of 30% of the R&D. The green is available to uh, subcontractors as needed or um, the small business or the research institution can also consume those parts of the R&D effort. The award always goes to the small business. Any subcontractors are um, always being paid by the small business. And um, there are two pots of funding. In some cases, you may fulfill the requirements of both programs. Um, and you can submit the same application to both programs. Um, if they are, if your application is meritorious, you might um, uh, you might increase the possibilities of getting an award. Um, I'm not going to read all these slides. I have a lot of information on my slides, and we'd be here forever if I read everything. <laughs> but you will download the slides. Make sure you review the small business eligibility um, for these programs. That's 500 employees or fewer, including affiliates. And then there are ownership criteria. Um, the legislation is such that the uh, businesses should be um, owned, majority owned or controlled by US citizens or permanent residents of the United States. And all the R&D effort must be performed in the United States. There are some very, very um, rare exclusions um, to that um, requirement. And then there's also requirements that you should review about um, the legal form and ownership by venture capital companies. The PI is the key individual designated by the applicant to direct the project. So they should be qualified to direct the project. They should be an expert in the technology area. Co-PIs are not allowed. You must identify um, the PI at the na by name at the application. Um, and they do not need to be employed. They need do not need to fulfill the employment requirements that I just discussed until the project starts. So that's helpful if you're considering forming a small business contingent upon receiving your SBIR award. Um, you can change the PI after award selection. It's not ideal. It can be done. And um, the PI should plan to devote three hours a week as a minimum to the project. Here's some rules. What does primary employment mean? Um, and then with STTR, the PI's primary employment can be either the small business or the research institution. Okay, so this program is for early stage research and development funding. It has to be innovative, novel. The award process is, fair, is very competitive. So the high quality, um, applications that are aligned with the topics they are applying for are going to be the ones that are funded. Uh, we do receive more meritorious applications than funding. So only the, so the highest quality applications are the ones that receive funding. Um, it's great to receive an award. Um, later on down the road, you're gonna want to be approaching investors or partners. And if you have received an award, it provides credibility about the you know, the technology um, that you're developing, that it has um, a sound scientific basis. And um, 
that it's novel as well too, because those are the important criteria um, in terms of receiving an award. And this is this is great funding for startups, so you don't have to pay it back. Um, whether the research goes really well or the research goes poorly, you do not have to pay it back. We don't take any of your company equity. No cost sharing is required as well. Okay, so um, in addition, um, you as a small business retain the worldwide patent rights to any invention developed with government support. Um, and the one caveat to that is that the federal government receives a royalty free license to the technology. Don't get uh, nervous <laughs> about that. Um, those are called marching rights. And they have, in fact, in the 40 year history of the SBIR program, never been executed. Um, there have been some cases that have been brought to court where uh, the royalty free license has been requested by another organization, such as a Medicaid, you know, some kind of medication that has been developed and um, should be offered to the public more uh, at, a, at a lower price. Um, but those claims have never been um, supported. And so, in fact, this caveat has never been um, executed. Your data that is generated and that you may disclose in your reports to us is protected for a minimum of 20 years from the start of your award. Um, and I already talked about the license. Okay. Um, I can... So as far as the program offices, uh, are concerned. We're talking about this release, release one. And um, there are six offices that issue topics. And um, these offices are shown here. You can tell by the names of these topics that um, they're kind of, I would say, deep sciency in nature, or rather these offices that they're kind of deep sciency in nature. And that is the case. They are looking for more deep science instrumentation, advanced scientific computing, imaging, um, and more. On November 12th, you should mark your calendar. We have seven other offices that will be issuing topics. Those are our more applied offices. So take note that you're going to want to look at those topics as well on November 12th. This is what our grants look like. Um, Phase one, um, you have to be responsive to our topics. Our topics are out. Hopefully you all have looked at our topics and hopefully you've attended the topic webinar or listened to the recording. Um, we do provide you with feedback on your letter of intent. The program managers will let you know in the event that your letter of intent is considered not to be responsive to the topic. Please, important to note that you can still submit your phase one application. You may want to adjust your approach based on the feedback you received. If your letter of intent is considered responsive, you will not hear anything from our office. So no news is good news in this sense. Um, there's the size of the awards. There's uh, the maximum size is topic dependent. Um, and we issue about 350 awards per year. If your phase one work goes well, nine and a half months in, you're gonna to wanna to submit your application to phase two, which is more focused on prototyping and demonstrating your technology. It's a larger grant and you carry out your phase two study over typically a two years. We do award second and third phase two awards as shown on this graph. Um, if you require additional R&D to transition to commercialization, you can apply for these follow on phase two awards. Okay, so let's go over the different offices very briefly. On each of these pages, I have the website link to these offices, um, their homepage. You should go review the offices. Um, you should uh, review their mission, see what's going on, what kind of conferences, think about attending some of those conferences. Um, so here are the topics that are published now for from the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office, we call it OSCAR. And they have a topic on high-performance computing 
cybersecurity, and then they also have um, accelerating the commercial deployment of some of the OSCAR funded software and libraries. Basic energy sciences, um, their mission is to study energy and matter to provide foundations for new energy technology. So they're looking at like sort of foundations for technology. They fund a wide array of technologies such as cryogenic cooling, um, subsurface characterization, advanced alloys, advanced spectrometers. They have um, about nine topics with a series of subtopics as shown on this page, um, it, characterizing subsurface energy, um, geothermal. Um, they have advanced materials for nuclear technology and lots more. Whoops. Yeah. Okay, the next office is, is our Biological and Environmental Research Office. Um, they are interested in um, improving their understanding of complex biological earth and environmental systems um, with respect to energy um, management and energy production. They are interested in atmospheric monitoring, biological characterization, data analytics, and bioimaging to understand the metabolic function of plants. Um, they, are, have, they have issued five topics um, very, in varied areas. Right now, they have one on atmospheric measurement technologies, the bioimaging, um, and delivery technologies for genetic engineering of bioenergy crops are amongst the topics that are out now. Okay, the fourth office that has issued topics is fusion energy. Um, they are they are um, tasked with advancing and eventually realizing the enormous potential of fusion energy. They are interested in additive manufacturing, lasers, plasmas, and superconducting magnets. And they have these six topics out right now. High energy physics um, is um, an office that develops new accelerator technology, detectors, and computational tools to enable the science of understanding matter and energy. Here is the table of contents that shows the topics that they have released. And then finally, uh, nuclear physics is um, tasked with understanding the building blocks of matter and nuclei. Um, they have a lot of interests around developing instrumentation, software for instrumentation and data management. So in uh, about the offices, just I, as I, I recommend you go to the websites, review the mission, understand their funding priorities and funding opportunity announcements. Um, you know, and what's going on in general in the office. And they generally have contact information as well. Although our topics have contact information as well too. So that's a good place to start. Okay, just a reminder that we have, um, yeah, this is November 6th. I think I'm gonna correct this. Um, I have, I just wanna correct that because it's not correct. Um, Oh no, let me go to my right side here. Okay, I just want to remind people that about the November 12th topics, these are the offices that issue topics. They are more applied in nature. One of our biggest offices is energy efficiency and renewable energy. And they have all these sub offices in there and they are a lot of the technologies that people associate with the Department of Energy. But as you can see, we issue a very wide array of topics. All right, now I'm gonna go a little bit into the application process. Here is the schedule on our funding opportunities page. Very important um, to go to this page and make sure you understand when, when the different parts are happening. Here's the topics document. I assume that you have all looked at the topics. 
If you have, um, if you are a first timer, please consider applying to our phase zero application assistance program. The topic webinars, if you missed them, they are recorded and available here. So go back and listen. Um, our FOA is here on this page. It's also in grants.gov. Um, we're having our webinar now. Don't forget letters of intent are due via the PAM system by 5 p.m. on August 27th. It is required as part of the application process. You cannot apply unless you have submitted a letter of intent. Full applications are due on October 8th and um, award notification is scheduled currently for January 6th when the grant start date would be on around February 18th of next year. Topics document, again, we use focus topics. The topics are out. Note that you open communication is permitted with the DOE program managers. You may reach out to them, but make sure that you're, the subject of your email is understanding the scope of the topic and whether what you're proposing is a good fit. It is not the place to sell your technology. Your application is the place to do that. Um, this is what a topic looks like. Please make note of the maximum phase one award amount. Do not ask for more than that money um, for your R&D effort. Make sure, check to see, are they accepting SVIR and are they accepting STTR application? Um, read the topic very carefully. Um, you have to pick a topic and you have to pick a subtopic pair. And there is a point of contact at the bottom of every subcontact. Make sure you're familiar with all the references. You are expected to be highly knowledgeable in your technology area. What are the latest developments? What are the competing technologies? And you definitely want to be knowledgeable about the references that are cited in their topics document. Funding opportunity announcement is out, um, has a lot of information. You do need to read the FOA in order to avoid making application mistakes. So spend some time um, in review of the funding opportunity announcement. Okay, a little bit more about the application process. Um, you have to register on some systems, unfortunately. Um, the application must be submitted through grants.gov, but to get your registration on grants.gov, um, first of all, you should go ahead and register on PAMS. Um, that takes five minutes. You should do it now, today, tomorrow. Um, your LOI must be submitted through PAMS. Then you need to go and work on your SAM registration. And the SAM registration can take eight weeks. So since we are, I think about nine weeks out from the application deadline, you need to, and you have, if you haven't started your SAM.gov registration, you need to go ahead and start it today. Um, because you will not be able to submit your application. Um, you'll not be able to get registered on grants.gov and submit your application until your SAM.gov registration is complete. You do also have to register with the SBA because the SBA has to confirm that you are a small business. So there's four registrations required, um, but you need to get started on it now. There are detailed in instructions at this link here on completing your registrations. So here's kind of the package. Um, you need the topics document, you need the FOA, and you need our application guide, um, which is an online resource, pretty new. Um, here is a slide on the letter of intent with your instructions and the content that it must um, contain. Make sure that you're very clear in your abstract on what it is you're going to do. Um, so that uh, the LOIs are used by us to understand what applications are going to be coming in, and we set up our we set up our technical review process in advance, so that when the applications come in, we can kind of hit the ground running in terms of reviewing and providing um, selections within 90 days, which is um, which is our schedule. So make sure that you're very clear on what it is that you're going to do, so that the program manager can understand. Um, um, what it is that you're proposing and can assign the appropriate technical reviewers. 
If you do receive an unresponsive email on your letters of intent, please note that it does not preclude you from submitting a phase one application. You should sit down and digest the review information and decide um, on a path forward with your team. It's required. Um, here's the LOI instruction link, and we have a sample LOI too um, on our pay on that link and here in the document as well. Um, okay, so you do have to complete your application and submit it on grants.gov. You can work on it online or you can download the application package, complete it offline and upload it again. Here are some links to get you started on grants.gov. We do have a checklist. It's in our, um, it's in here in the link here, um, the checklist, you can view the checklist. So here you are, here are all the things that have to be included in your application. It's a lot. Um, um, so get, you do want to get organized and get started. Um, but this checklist will allow you to ensure that you are not missing any critical parts of your application. Uh, there is help available for you. Um, the phase zero program, which I've already spoke about. This is our application resource team. You can email them at any time to ask questions about the application process. They will get back to you. If for any reason you don't hear back from them, you can always email me and I can ping them for you. You should be on our mailing list. It's the most important way to stay up to date on what's going on. You'll receive information about other funding opportunities and you'll get invited to webinars. This webinar is recorded and the topic webinars are recorded. And finally, very importantly, we are doing seven, not including tomorrow's webinar, we're gonna do seven Ask Us Anything Q&A webinars during the application process. First one will be on August 21st. You, can, you will be invited um, to the first two. And then if you submit your letter of intent, you will be invited to the, the subsequent five um, Q&A sessions, and you can hop on a call and ask us your application questions. Um, just a quick slide on the Phase Zero program. You will receive a coach. The apply portal for this release is open now. You will have someone you can talk to, someone who can help you with your letter of intent, someone that will help you with your system registrations, your proposal preparation. They will provide you with feedback on your project narrative. Most of the coaches are scientists or engineers, so they're going to be able to review, not for the you know, detail of technical knowledge, but to make sure that your application reads well, because you really want your application to read easily, to flow, to have it be a story about what it is you're going to do that even someone who's not a technical expert in your field can understand. They will help you fill out your financial forms, your budget, calculate your indirect rate, and a lot of good stuff in here. We have a new, it's not that new, it's about a year and a half old um, application guide. Um, it's a content management system, highly searchable. It has lots of detailed instructions. It has a planner, help you get organized um, and sample all the samples that we have um, and blank forms that we have. Um, are on this page. So make good use of it and feel free to give me feedback on it. And since it's, you know, only a year old, I'm always interested in hearing how it can be made better. You know, the uh, program is um, kind of the different functions of the program are scattered throughout the DOE. Um, the um, program offices, they are the scientific um, experts in their technology area, they develop the topics, they pick the reviewers and they recommend the awardees and they also oversee your project. We work with the Chicago office. You will be, have a, if you are selected for award, you will receive a contract officer who will help you, um, you know, pencil in your grant, the grant details, help you with your new awards, help you with your phase two awards. Um, grant closeout, any budgeting questions, you'll reach out to them. And then we are at the bottom, we are the program's office and we um, administer the entire process. 
what makes a competitive application? Well, the first uh, most important criteria and the basis for developing a strong application is that you need to be responsive to the topic and subtopic pair. Um, your idea must be novel. Your, you must have a solid work plan. Um, make sure you're, you have, you're gonna have feasibility objectives in your phase one project. Make sure your work plan is linked strongly to your feasibility objectives. Make sure you have the right team. You can add, that's the purpose that we have for us to allow subcontractors. If you need to add someone to your team as a subcontractor, um, you if you feel like it's needed, don't do it for any kind of uh, sort of uh, to, to impress us. It's just something that you may need to carry out the project um, and the impact as well. We do have a, a new um, application review criteria, which is a short um, diversity and equity inclusion plan um, that you do need to include as an appendix to your project narrative, and we call it the peer plan. The first three criteria are the most heavily weighted criteria with the fourth one um, also being part of the um, overall um, criteria. We use at least, we send your application out to at least three technical reviewers. Um, and then the reviews come back into the program offices and the program managers based on the reviews. They rank the applications and the highest, highest regarded applications are the ones that receive funding. You will be notified of the decision um, 90 days after you submit your application. You will receive reviewer comments as well. Here is the timeline for the purposes of time. I won't go into it um, too, in too much detail but your applications are due here at month zero. Um, your award notification is within 90 days. And then there's a period of time where you're negotiating with the contracts office on your grant. Um, and so that is why your budget, your, your project will start um, more like four, four and a half months after you submit your application, which is it's what you can approximately expect. There is a data management plan. Um, and um, I am going to um, change slides for a second. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second because I think I need to open a different presentation. Sorry for the delay here, but it'll be worth it. Hey, I'm going back to sharing my screen here. This is my slightly updated presentation, so I wanted to go with that. Okay, we have a data management plan that is required. There are two options here. Um, if you do, you do have the option of not, e not including a data management plan, even though we say it's required. Um, we will assume option one, which is that your data is protected. But if you do plan to publicly disclose your data, which you may want to do to sell what it is that you're doing and get people excited about your technology, you do need to um, include that in your application. So um, we have, um, since 20, fiscal year 2023, required that applicants disclose their foreign requests relationships. So please download the latest form and complete that. And you do need to sign it. Um, and even if you have no foreign relationships, you must check no to everything and sign it as well. But again, I'm not emphasizing that you should please utilize the latest form by clicking on the links shown here. 
Additionally, we require biosketches and current and pending support information. Um, we strongly recommend that you use a SciNCV format that's approved by the National Science Foundation. And I have provided the links here, which provide instructions on preparing your biosketches and your current and pending, pending support. I have a few slides on the peer plan. It's a year um, we've been requiring it since fiscal year 2024. Um, it is part of the technical merit review criteria, um, and it should, um, should be a plan um, to promote equity and inclusion as part of the research and your research and development project. Um, you can include um, some plans to recruit individuals from diverse backgrounds um, and groups historically underrepresented in the research community to work on the project. Um, you can develop um, approaches and methods to create a research and development environment that fosters a safe, positive, inclusive workplace and a sense of belonging. Um, you can support the people within your company, uh, underrepresented staff, by providing them with training, mentoring, and partnering. Um, or you can work with underrepresented communities as well, too. Um, it's really about leveraging, um, about moving the needle and doing something a little bit new and different within your organization on this front. I do have um, provide some resources, um, peer plan development, such as what kinds of things you can focus on. And just as a final note, um, the phase one award is very limited. We understand that. Um, award size is 200 or 250,000. It is expected that you really will submit a one page peer plan, pick a simple and focused activity that's relevant to the scope of the award. Um, don't try to do like a million things. <laughs> try to pick something, one thing that you can do, do well, and will also um, be part of your R&D project. We're always looking for genuine and new ideas as well. Proprietary data, this has changed in, I guess, the last about a year ago as well. Um, you do want to um, protect the proprietary information that you include in your application. Um, and I have some instructions here on the title page of the document. You do need to um, include this legend, including inserting page numbers that do not contain restricted information. And then um, you have a legend for each page of the proposal that contains information. Note this is different than how it used to be. And hopefully people are gonna view this as easier. There are no more marking requirements, the highlighting, the asterisks, the brackets that contain protected information. You just need to put a legend on those pages. Instructions and examples are provided as well. A few things, um, a few notes about the application errors that we see. I mean, the number one thing is reading the funding opportunity announcement. It will prevent you from um, making these mistakes. Um, I won't read through them all, but um, these are just important. Take a look at them. Um, review them before you submit your application. I would, I think it would be a good checklist to go through before you submit your application. People are always interested in past award rates from fiscal year 2024. 17% of the applications were meritorious um, and awarded and 20, an additional 24% were meritorious application recommended for funding and not awarded. Um, because of limita funding limitations. Here are the phase two statistics. 32% were awarded. And this is fiscal year 2023, by the way, because we're not completing, we haven't completed the 2024 phase two award processing. Um, I talked about the second phase two awards, phase two A and phase two B. They're two different um, types of phase, of second phase two awards. These award rates are 41% and 
Okay, a little bit about, um, I'm gonna go kind of quickly through um, these applicant and award um, resources, but if you are an awardee, there will be a phase one principal investigator meeting at two days in the DC area. So you should do want to consider the cost of the trip in your phase one budget. And you're going to want to send your principal investigator and you can send a business official as well because there's a lot in the meeting about commercialization strategies, preparing your phase two commercialization plan um, and more. So it's up to you, but you can um, budget one or two. You need to budget one, the PI for this trip and you may want to budget a business official as well. Okay, importantly in your phase one application, above the maximum award amount, I've been talking about that 200 or that 250,000, you can put an additional 6,500 in your budget for your own technical and business assistance vendor. Um, TABA is a series of um, different services you can pay an external contractor for to help you develop your phase one, phase two commercialization plan. That's really what the phase one TABA money is for. Um, what is your business strategy? What is the market landscape? Intellectual property landscape, pricing, developing a pitch deck, who your customers are. Um, you can spend money on those kinds of things. You can also do nothing in your phase one application. If you receive an award, you will be able to utilize our DOE vendor. Um, their name is Larda and you will get $6,500 in services from them um, automatically. The, night, the, the cool thing about the TABA program is if you receive a phase two award, you can spend up to $50,000 on commercialization activities. If you become a phase one awardee, you are eligible to our phase, for our phase shift program, formerly known as Energy i -Corps. It is an intensive customer discovery process, very valuable. Um, for you to understand your market, um, who your potential customers are. Just a slide on the importance of making sure that you are not only addressing the R&D and the technology development work, but you are thinking about commercializing your technology. It is never too early to start thinking about who your customers are going to be. We have a very great partnering site um, that we launched about a year a year ago or something like that. And I do think that everybody, whether you're an applicant or wardee, or even if you're not an applicant, you should register as an innovator, if you're an innovator or a partner, if you're a partner. Um, it is an ecosystem um, which is designed to allow you to meet the potential partners, the potential customers, the potential venture capital capital organizations that you're going to want to know in the future. So go to the partnering site, check it out, register. Um, there's some other resources on this slide as well um, about working with the national labs. A little bit of information. If you have questions about the partnering platform, you can reach out to our tech to market advisor, Carol Rapke. Okay, with that said, I am going to introduce um, Sarah Hinderer, who is a special agent with the Office of Inspector, the Ins Office of Inspector General. She's gonna talk a little bit about fraud, waste, and abuse. And Sarah, just go ahead and tell me when to go to the next slide. I will be driving. Okay, sounds good. Again, I'm a special agent, Sarah Hinderer. I'm with uh, the Office of the Inspector General. And what we deal with is fraud, waste, and abuse. You can go to the next slide. So there are some different elements when it comes to fraud. So we work uh, criminal and civil investigations. And so some of the things that we look for um, when we're looking at the proposal um, that that awardees submit, uh, anything that happens during the award, and then any closeout documents, is that we're looking to see if there was any plagiarism with the proposal, if there were any false information that was given in the proposal information, um, especially concerning the PI, um, any fraudulent documents that may um, been provided to DOE um, as part of the, the um, 
the proposal period. And then during the award, we're also going to be looking at, again, were the funds used correctly? Were the funds used in a way that's allowable to DOE. And I always stress to people, if you're not sure if something's allowable, please reach out to DOE so that they can tell you if it's an allowable cost. Um, and also if you um, are responsible for submitting any kind of uh, reports during the course of the award, if those are plagiarized or there's any false statements or claims that have been made, um, that's considered fraud. Um, and then also, if you're claiming your results from another award, um, a different source, that's also considered fraud as well. If you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so you, uh, they've already gone over a lot of the rules um, with these awards, but some of the ones that um, we want to uh, draw your attention to is any kind of duplicate or overlapping proposals. So again, uh, the OIG works with NASA OIG and NSF OIG and a lot of the other agencies. So we're aware if you've submitted something to another agency and what you're submitting to DOE is a duplicate or it's an overlapping pr proposal. Another big thing is the SBA that's the Small Business Administration, making sure that you meet the requirements for a small business. Uh, again, American owned and 500 employees or fewer. Uh, for SBIRs, your PI's primary employment must be uh, with the company during that time period, um, and they cannot be a full-time employee anywhere else. Um, and then also for the phase one, uh, two-thirds of the research search effort must be performed by your business. Uh, for phase two, it's going to be one half. So just be careful when you are using a, um, a university or a research lab um, to make sure that you're, you're meeting that requirement there. Um, and then um, university employees participating in an SBI award should disclose their involvement to the university. Um, to make sure, because again, we do talk with universities and we do go to them to get information um, if we suspect that there is fraud. So make sure that universities are being um, informed and also your research and development that has to be performed in the United States. Next slide. What happens if you break the rules? Um, so um, if you commit fraud or any kind of wrongdoing, we can investigate. And again, we're talking criminal violations and civil. And keep in mind that criminal violations can result in prison time um, and civil uh, violations can result in a monetary uh, penalty for you and your business. We work with, with the Department of Justice um, to prosecute these cases. And again, we also do coordinate um, if you are getting research dollars with other agencies we do coordinate with their OIGs um, for investigations. So just keep that in mind um, when you're filling out your proposals and um, all the award documentation that you're not um, submitting anything that's fraudulent or uh, misleading. Next slide. So this is a recent case. I was actually the case agent for this one and this was a criminal prosecution. And I'll briefly explain to you what happened. This company, Science Tomorrow, um, they had two owners, uh, Jyoti Agarwal and Subhadarshi Nayak. Um, and uh, Nayak was the PI. Um, what they ended up doing is they had a phase one. They were going to submit for their phase two award. And it was crunch time in order to get the, the proposal in. And they had um, a letter of intent from a university. Um, and that university was not giving them the amount that they wanted for their proposal. So they took that letter of intent from the university and they forged it. And they changed uh, a few things on it to include how much money they were claiming the university was going to give towards this project. Um, and that was a huge um, uh, uh, violation. And uh, that ended up being fraud from the inception of the award. Um, so that's kind of what kicked everything off. Um, and then during the course of the award, um, there were some issues with how they spent the money. 
Um, Agarwal ended up getting her MBA uh, from the University of Chicago, which was not allowable by DOE. Um, and that was about $146,000. Um, and then also um, they did not return, they had unused funds at the end of the award period. And as you all probably know now, and if you don't, you should know that at the end of the award period, that if there's any unused funds, those need to go back to the department. Um, and so they kept, uh, Agrawal kept about 300,000, which she lived off. That's what she admitted to, to me is that she was living off of those funds. Um, and then also her final certifications. Um, we uh, had all of her bank records, all of the business's bank records. And we could tell that for some of the subcontractors, one, she didn't pay the research institution that she claimed that she was using for either the phase one or the phase two. And then she um, lied about the amount that she paid to some other universities for some work on the final certifications. And so when we went to court, we went to trial over this, we were able to submit those false certifications because we knew based on her bank records that she didn't actually pay out the amount of money. She actually kept that uh, and didn't pay it to the universities like she claimed. Um, and then there was also some issues with double billing because um, as you can see up there on the screen, they have um, uh, another award with the state of Kentucky because the state of Kentucky will do a matching grant if you have a federal grant. And so they did some double billing and claimed some of the same um, bills, both on the DOE award and on the Kentucky state matching grant. Um, so with all this being said, both of them um, were prosecuted for this case. Uh, we're talking about conspiracy to commit wire fraud, wire fraud, and money laundering. And those come with hefty um, uh, sentencing guidelines. Um, and as you can see, Agrawal, uh, she did go to trial. She was convicted on all of the charges, and she was sentenced to 42 months in prison. She is currently still in prison, serving that prison sentence. Um, NIAC was able to work out a plea agreement with the Department of Justice. Um, and so he did six months in prison and six months home confinement. But another big thing to think about is they now owe restitution to the Department of Energy and to the Kentucky State uh, for the matching grant. And uh, we were able to go after them for, for the full amount of the award. So they received um, between the phase one and the phase two, a little over a million dollars which they have to pay back to the government. And then they also have to pay back the 500,000 to the state of Kentucky. And NIAC also had um, EPA awards and we worked with EPA OIG because he also committed uh, fraud with those awards too. And it was a joint investigation between um, uh, DOE OIG and EPA OIG. So just keep that in mind. We do work with other agencies to make sure that all the awards that you receive from the government um, are being done properly. Um, but this is just a cautionary tale of what can happen if you do commit fraud. So again, forge documents, that is a big no-no. Um, make sure that any expenses um, that you're gonna use the money for, that it's allowable by DOE, and don't lie on any of your final certifications or any reports or anything that goes to the department. Any of those false statements, those are those are criminal violations. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, next slide. And so if you are aware, whether it's um, something that's going on with your organization or another organization, but if you are aware of any kind of fraud, waste, abuse, um, this is the contact information. We have a hotline set up. Um, you can do it anonymously, um, or you can provide your con contact information, and you can report um, any kind of fraud, waste, or abuse uh, to the Office of the Inspector General. And that, I think, is it for me. Yes, thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. All right, just a few reminders before we wrap up. Um, please do not forget that we have a number of applicant resources for you, a new guide. We have our application assistance program. Check out the links on our website. Um, and uh, of course the phase zero program is free to you. And um, if you are a first time applicant. 
These um, are, we have a number of awardee resources as well, too. If you receive, it's our program is not just about your phase one, your phase two award. We provide a fair amount of support in the commercialization resources area between our um, phase shift program, the TABA funds, and a bunch of partnering, really good partnering initiatives that we have going on. Um, and be aware that you also can apply for um, computing time as well as an awardee. Um, we will give you time on our uh, high performance uh, computing uh, system. So thank you for your time. Get yourself organized. There's a, unfortunately a fair amount of work. There's a planner here on this link of what you should be kind of getting done each week. Um, and we ha I have emails here where you can reach out to with questions. And we do have a, a, a lot of success stories which contain a, a good wealth of information and advice uh, to startups. So thank you for your time. It's three o'clock right on time and I'm gonna hand it back to you, Zena. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Sarah, for presenting today. Um, uh, so there, uh, we, we are not taking questions uh, um, today. Join us tomorrow for the uh, FOA question and answer webinar. The registration link is on our web website under the funding opportunities uh, webpage. So uh, uh, the recording uh, for today and tomorrow will be posted on our website under the funding opportunities webpage. Uh, with the thank you for attending and uh, this concludes uh, today's webinar.